we have here? We have Camille Crittenden here, and she serves as the Deputy Director of, for Citrus, and this is the Center for Information Technology Research in the Interest of Society. She's also a Director for Data and Democracy Initiative and the Executive Director of the Social Apps Lab. And prior to being at Citrus, she was Executive Director of the Human Rights Center at Berkeley Law, where she helped develop a program in human rights technology and new media. So I'd like to welcome Camille. Thank you, Kevin. Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us here on this Sunday morning. Um, I know you've already been sitting here for an hour, so I thought I would ask uh, just a little question to help us all get a sense of who's in the room and maybe offer the opportunity for you just to stand up at your place and sit down <laughs> and get a little fresh air. Um, so my question uh, is, who here represents academia? Are you a faculty member, student, postdoc? Feel free to stand if you like. Great. Thank you. Um, how about uh, corporations, industry? Great. Good. How about uh, the government sector, public sector? Not so much. Thank you. Um, how about NGOs or nonprofits? Great. Well, that's, that's good to see. Thank you. <laughs> So here's what I thought I would uh, talk with you about for the next 45 minutes or so. I'd like you to, um, to tell you a little bit about what Citrus is and the Data and Democracy Initiative. Um, and then I want to just give sort of an overview of a number of IT applications in these various areas around human rights, civic participation, and humanitarian aid. Um, and then just observe a few challenges and opportunities. This has been a wonderful conference. Um, so far, we have gotten a really in-depth look at a lot of very innovative and specific projects. And what I hope to offer here in the next 40 minutes or so is more of an overview so that maybe if some of you are coming from a very specific sector, you'll get a little bit a broader view of what else is out there and how the technologies that you're developing might also apply or make a contribution to a, a different area. So about Citrus, um, Catherine mentioned that the long and awkward acronym stands for the Center for IT Research in the Interest of Society. We're a multi-campus research unit of the University of California. We're based at UC Berkeley, but we have affiliated campuses at Davis, Merced, and Santa Cruz. And at Davis, we also work closely with the Sacramento campus of the Medical Center. So in our, in our healthcare work, we work with the, the technologists and clinical providers there. We get about four million dollars a year from the office of the president. That's our main um, operations funding, but we leverage that with the faculty members who are affiliated with us into research funding on the order of about a hundred million dollars. So we are a relatively small uh, staff, but we have a number of affiliated faculty members that we try to assist them in their work either in fundraising or program development or project development. Um, and across the four campuses, we have about 300 or so, 350 uh, faculty affiliates. Part of our mission when we were founded um, back in 2001 through a grant from the state of California was also to spur economic benefit in the state. And so we do that in a variety of ways, um, partly through the students that we support who then in some cases go on and either work directly in industry or found their own startup companies. Um, and about 41 startups have been started uh, through the Citrus ecosystem, which I'll tell you a little bit more about. We have four main research thrusts, uh, and I'll speak just briefly about three of them and then go into a little bit more depth about the Data and Democracy Initiative. In healthcare, we work uh, in a number of fields, primarily with the folks at um, UC Davis, but also in some of the other campuses, especially as it might relate to, say, medical robotics or device design. Um, there are faculty members at Santa Cruz and Merced that uh, work actively in those areas. So we're interested not just in the, in the device side, but also in the behavior side and trying to come up with um, apps and using gaming technologies and such that are going to improve health and wellness. In energy, we work closely with the California Institute for Energy and the Environment. Some of you may know this organization, CIEE. Um, 
we do a lot of work uh, looking at, at energy generation and distribution all the way from the, the large grid all the way down to um, building automation and building robotics in order to try to improve energy efficiency um, at the large scale as well as on the, on the smaller scale. Intelligent infrastructures crosses over into that area somewhat, but is more focused on water monitoring, air quality monitoring, transportation, things like that, using wireless sensor networks. Um, we have a large array of sensors in the American River Basin here in Northern California, um, and then up through the Sierras. So some of our researchers have these huge um, sensor arrays that are powered by solar that are able to take very um, fine measurements of the snowpack and other water that's available that helps the water boards and other agencies do better forecasting of water availability. Then in the Data and Democracy Initiative, um, we're really charged with creating new tools to improve civic engagement and, and education on a range of political and social and economic issues. So I'll say a little bit more about that. Um, I came to Citrus uh, a couple of years ago to co-direct the Data and Democracy Initiative together with a faculty member um, that I'll introduce in, in a minute. Uh, I was really motivated by this particular program coming out of my work at the Human Rights Center where I was working on um, human rights and technology and new media, trying to both improve the tools for research on human rights issues, which I'll share more about in a minute, but also on human rights advocacy and trying to um, help build, build a movement for awareness raising and, and change. So here's the, the mission statement for DDI. Um, we're creating tools. This was something that really appealed to me as well. There are a number of institutes for the internet and society, for democracy, um, but often they're based within law schools or public policy schools, so they're looking at uh, research that's analyzing policy or trying to make uh, legal changes rather than actually building the tools themselves. So I know I'm here speaking with a room of engineers and people who like to build things, so that really appealed to me as well to go over to the engineering computer science side where people are, are creating these tools that are going to actually um, hopefully have an impact in the field. So here's our team. Um, Ken Goldberg, some of you may know, he does also a lot of work in robotics, um, but he's the faculty director of the Data and Democracy Initiative. I am the staff director, and then we work with a, a research and development postdoc, uh, Brandy Nonicky, and you'll hear more about her work in a bit. We have a small advisory board for the initiative, and the reason I wanted to put this slide up is just to call out a couple of people who also work in humanitarian areas that you might be familiar with. Um, Pramal Shah is the president of Kiva.org, a microlending organization. Um, Emily Jacoby was, still is the executive director of Digital Democracy that's done a lot of work in the field, especially in Burma and also in Haiti. Um, Alec Ross was a former head of innovation with Hillary Clinton at the State Department. And um, Gavin Newsom, I'll tell you a, a, about a specific project that we're working with him on. I'll just pause there for a moment if anyone has any questions or wants to say anything about Citrus and our Data and Democracy Initiative. We'll probably still have time at the end, but that sort of concludes the institutional introduction of the, <laughs> of the remarks. So here I'm really eager to, um, to get into some of these tech applications for these specific um, content areas. And my goal here, in addition just to, to trying to set a broader stage for potential conversations outside, is also to encourage people who might be looking for projects or um, haven't yet decided about how their specific tech skills or talents might be applied to say, look, here are a whole range of opportunities um, that could really use the, the work and, and talents that you're, that you're building now. So here are just a few of the topics that I'd like to, um, to discuss this morning, some tech applications for human rights and crisis mapping, remote sensing, video, forensic analysis, and big data. We talk a lot about big data these days, um, but it hasn't been so broadly applied, at least that term, to the field of human rights. And I just want to give you a few illustrations of how that um, might apply. So how many of you have heard of Ushahidi? Okay, good. Well, I'm glad that you have, and I'm glad that I won't be boring the rest of you <laughs> by introducing them. Um, Ushahidi is a group that was founded at the end of 2007, beginning of 2008 in Kenya, right after the violence that erupted there after the contested presidential election. Um, there, as you might know, Nairobi is becoming a real tech 
hub in Eastern Africa. And at that time, there were already a few um, people who were interested and, and skilled in technology who came together to create this, um, this organization that would be able to map instances of violence. So it's really this idea of crowdsourced mapping um, for, that, that came out of this um, political crisis in, in 2008. The name Ushahidi means witness in Swahili. And it has been used, um, some of their mapping technology, uh, it's open source if you go look at their website. They have a whole range of examples um, now that have been built out of this original example um, that happened in Kenya. So it's been a terrific tool for really mapping and monitoring human rights violations. Um, but it's also been applied to examples as, um, as various as where are the snow plows um, working in Chicago. There was a blizzard a few years ago and um, some enterprising tech entrepreneurs used the Yushahidi platform to show where the snow plows had gone. Or um, in Hawaii, I think there's sort of an adopt a siren kind of program where you have uh, tsunami warning sirens that various neighborhoods or blocks are responsible for making sure that the batteries are alive and everything is okay with the tsunami warning. So they use the Ushahidi platform for that as well. Um, so it's a very flexible kind of platform, but it really came out of this idea of crisis mapping. It's been used in Syria um, to, to track um, particularly violence against women. Um, so you'll probably see some of those applications there. But it's a really, it was very innovative and has continued to be um, an important tool for this idea of crowdsourced mapping. Another application is in remote monitoring or using um, satellites or now drone technology in some cases for monitoring um, human, human rights violations. Uh, in this case, this was a project by a group called Satellite Sentinel um, that was able to show evidence of war crimes in South Sudan. And what they're showing there is the evidence of mass graves. So anything that you can see from the sky um, can eventually be used either to incite an investigation or with the right kind of technology and chain of custody kind of um, uh, security in place that it could ultimately be used in a court of, court of law, international criminal court, um, other kinds of proceedings. So again, it, uh, it's going, it continues to go on this idea of remote monitoring um, through in Syria now, destruction of World Heritage Sites and, and other war crimes. So you can really see a lot, actually, more than you might imagine. Um, it's been used also in South Asia, say in Thailand and Burma, as evidence of illegal logging. Um, you can see it for village destruction uh, of, say, the ethnic Rohingya group in the border areas of Burma. Um, so a lot of this remote sensing can be used eventually to prove evidence of war crimes. And interestingly, sometimes it can also be um, matched up with social media accounts or people who use their cell phones to show, you know, look, this building is being bombed as we speak. You can get the before and after kind of imagery from the remote sensing as well that helps to corroborate some of those stories. So speaking of video, video now that everyone has a video phone in their pocket, um, it's become a very powerful tool actually for human rights, for documenting human rights violations. So there are a number of groups who are doing this work. Witness is one um, that you may know of. They have been quite prominent um, even back in the days of VHS <laughs> to, to take cameras into areas that are struck by human rights violations and to train people on the ground to work with them um, to be able to document instances of, of human rights abuses or, or protests. The DARE is a more kind of under the radar kind of group. They um, have stealth technology for, um, for recording. They um, embed the, the videos and the cameras into things like wood logs or into people's clothing in a very surreptitious kind of way in order to document interactions that they might have with officials who are um, corrupt or accepting bribes or admitting to, to war crimes or, or torture or whatnot. The Rashomon Project I'll take just a moment to talk about because it comes out of the Data and Democracy Initiative. This is one that we're developing here at UC Berkeley. 
It was inspired originally by some campus protests a couple of years ago at UC Davis. You might remember there was this iconic image of the protesters sitting on the ground and of the security officers pepper spraying the students as they're sitting there with their hands over their head. Well, when you look at photographs of it, you see the students on the ground, you see the security, but then you also see this whole array of other students and journalists with their cameras and their you know, huge telescopes and the uh, video cameras that are documenting the whole thing. Well, what we wanted to do was to offer a broader perspective on what was happening so that you don't just see it from the police perspective or from the journalist perspective, but really to take the power of the crowd again and try to compile and synchronize all of the accounts that we could get our hands on of a particular moment. So the Rashomon Project creates this multi-perspective synchronized view of particularly contested moments. It works best if there is something like a, a spraying incident or an acute moment um, when you can really get a variety of perspectives and maybe see, you know, were the police being provoked or were they um, doing something else kind of around the corner that made the activists lash out against them or whatever the case might be. You can just get a broader sense of what the, what the situation was. So Rashomon alludes to a, a film by Akira Kurosawa where it's a story of an event that happened and is told from a variety of perspectives and everyone was there and everyone's account was true but they're quite different in the way that they're represented. So again, going back to forensic analysis and thinking about what kinds of technology can be helpful in um, showing evidence of human rights abuses or, or war crimes. This photo is actually quite recent. It came just from the last week or two um, when there was a place in Florida where evidence had been uncovered of unmarked graves of boys who had been tortured or children who had been tortured and killed um, in a school in, in Florida. So, this kind of technology, they're using some kind of radar to, to detect um, the, the graves beneath the surface of the, um, of the ground. But this, this kind of forensic analysis for uncovering mass graves and such has been used in Bosnia or other places where, where that kind of um, um, torture had, had been happening. We also use DNA um, to document family separations caused by war. This was another project that I worked on at the Human Rights Center called the DNA Reunification Project. So you'll recall perhaps in El Salvador, in the conflict in El Salvador um, in the 90s or so, that there were a lot of abductions and disappearances. This is a case in other areas of conflict in Latin America as well. And so what we did there was to work with a local group called Probuscada that was trying to find the children of the um, parents and families who had been abducted and in many cases had been adopted either through the Red Cross or otherwise either into military families or other families locally or into the United States or Europe. So we created uh, together with the Department of Justice here in Richmond a large DNA database of reference samples. We would take samples from the various family members and then try to seek out or make it known that we were running this project and young adults would come to us and say, I want to know more to find out about my heritage. Maybe I was one of those who had been abducted. So we took those samples and were able to, um, to confirm family relationships and then eventually, in many cases, reunite the families. So this was meant not just for a humanitarian um, kind of project to, to restore some kind of peace of mind or provide answers to the families, but also to document that this, this was happening and was a, a crime that could be prosecuted in the inter-American court or that could be used as evidence in other kind of legal commissions. Here's this idea about big data and now that we have all these wonderful new tools for data visualization, data management, data analysis, um, how can it be applied to these instances of conflict and, and crime? Um, this Syria tracker is a wonderful application um, that you can go on and go through all kinds of different filters and see mapping and charts and, and all of that. Um, so I really want to encourage folks who are working on, on big data kind of applications to think about this as a domain area as well. 
this can help anyone who's interested in learning more about this conflict to have a better sense of it, a more rounded sense of it, whether that's just us being informed citizens or if it's um, journalists or political scientists or legislators who are um, looking at, at the conflict. There are a couple of organizations who are doing this kind of work. It really comes out of demography and statistics. The Human Rights Data Analysis Group works on, they, they came out of uh, Benetech, which is based here in the area, um, and they've worked a lot on forced disappearances, forced migration. Um, they did a big project in Guatemala where they found this whole trove of police records. Um, in some cases, as in the, the Nazi regime, even torturers keep very meticulous records of the people that they've been abducting and where they are, what happened to them. Um, so by, by doing this, they were able to prove a number of crimes, extrajudicial killings and such um, in Guatemala. Palantir, you probably know the organization, they do work also in their philanthropy group around things like human trafficking and arms trafficking. Um, they have done some really wonderful case studies in these areas. So I encourage you to, to check those out as well. So here are a few other uh, applications in governance and democracy. Um, open data, I'm a big fan and champion of, of open data uh, applications. There was a conversation yesterday about the importance of open data standards and disaster relief. And that's something that we would love to encourage and, and see more of. Open data, the open data movement has really come about in the last few years at the national level, but then also at the state and local level um, all around the world. And I'll give you a few examples um, here for national examples as well as international ones. How can this be applied in the humanitarian space? There are a number of groups that are doing this kind of work for aid, really monitoring not just the um, national level aid, but also, as Luke had mentioned earlier, the foreign direct investments and other kinds of um, money that's flowing from one country to another. And anti-corruption programs and, of course, in election monitoring. So the open data movement uh, came about around 2009 or so, I think. The, uh, the White House had been quite a leader in it and set up pretty soon after Barack Obama was elected this data.gov portal where they were making a lot of data sets available. Um, India also has been quite a leader in this area, and this example comes from the Indian um, government where they have a, data, a daily data visualization drawing from the various data sets that are available there. And this one is showing the decrease in child infant mortality rates from um, 2004 to 2012 but I encourage you to look at the website because they make these data sets available for others to do their own visualizations, but they also have theirs for ideas and inspiration. Um, they've been quite aggressive in putting a lot of that data out there. The UK as well, the EU, um, and there are, there are many more. As I mentioned, open data can be a great tool for transparency in how aid funding is distributed as well, and Aid Data is one organization that's based at the College of William & Mary that's doing a lot of this work, doing really innovative work in showing and making available a lot of these data sets regarding humanitarian aid and investments. There's the International Aid Transparency Initiative. So this is another kind of technical field that can contribute to more effective humanitarian assistance and humanitarian interventions by just making the the data more, more available to anyone who wants to either support it, learn more about it, or critique it and say, hey, why is this country getting more? Or why is this particular part of the country getting more? Who's managing the aid? I don't really see, you know, this was given for infrastructure. I don't see the roads or the bridges that were supposed to be being built. Um, so it's just a good check and balance. I don't know if you know about the UN Global Pulse. Um, they are doing amazing work in, in making data available and having really um, smart visualizations around data as well. Robert Kirkpatrick is the fellow who went to, to run it, and he, I think he was originally from around here um, and worked in public health a lot, but then went to, to the UN to develop this Global Pulse initiative. So here are a couple of examples of, I think these are Twitter feeds that are addressing these different issues, risk and disaster, energy, agriculture, ocean and water, et cetera. So really trying to harness the um, 
power of social media to get an understanding of where the interest is and where support might be for these various issues. The World Bank and other international development banks are also making a lot of data available. So if this is an area of interest, I encourage you to take a look. They have terrific interactive widgets and APIs and things that you can go and really investigate um, where the World Bank is making their investments as well. Anti-corruption applications are a terrific place to look also for tech innovation. How many of you have heard of I paid a bribe? <laughs> um, this is a, a program in India, actually, where you can anonymously report that you had to pay a police officer to get out of a traffic ticket or to get out of a jaywalking ticket or whatever the, the case might be. Um, and it's meant to promote transparency in some of these areas where the um, security forces might not be as, um, as above board as you might hope them to be, um, not just in India, but in other places as well. But this is the, the application that came out of India. I paid a bribe. The other one, the anti-corruption internet database or anti-graft is from Nigeria. So there's another case where there's a, um, a, lot, a lot of money flowing around that's meant to be directed in many cases to infrastructure projects that, you know, maybe they went to the contracting company or the head, but then are the projects really being fulfilled? Are they actually um, being built? And of course, for election monitoring, um, the mobile applications are a huge benefit there. And this is a recent example from Afghanistan um, from the recent elections. So you can have, you can mobilize teams of volunteers all with mobile phones, and they don't even have to be smartphones. You know, you can build applications for the regular feature phones about um, cases where they might have seen something irregular at specific polling places. But here you're really, again, empowering the people who are on the ground in the field, have eyes and ears there, to be able to report back what they're seeing and can really improve both the actual outcome but also the confidence in the outcome if you have people who say, yes, I was there and this is what, what we saw and noted. So healthcare, I'm going to give just a couple of quick examples because there are many, and I know that a number of you are here actually presenting health applications for, um, for global humanitarian technology. So I'll mention just, just a couple here. Um, one is CellScope. This was developed at, by a professor at UC Berkeley who attached an otoscope at first to uh, an iPhone. So you can get a very high resolution photograph of the inner ear to say, you know, is my kid have an ear infection? What is this? And it was developed first for developing countries. I think it was in India at first. But what I wanted to say about this example particularly is a point that was sort of made earlier is that it's not just the developed countries, you know, US, UK, wherever, making these technologies that are then going to be, you know, imparted to the beneficiaries. In this case, that was one that was one step, but we really learned a lot from it, and it has come back. There's also more this kind of boomerang effect of having it be tested or the idea thought out in these um, more low resource areas that actually are going to benefit everyone. Um, because if you are a, a mom or dad and you have a sick kid who's holding his ear, you can stick this scope on your iPhone and you know send it to your doctor. And there are other kinds of M Health applications being developed now too, using smartphone technology where you can email photos of various things to your doctor and such. Um, but I think this is true in a number of cases where even though we might think that we're building these technologies for areas that are more low resource, that they're eventually um, going to have applications everywhere and, and benefit a lot of us. There are a number of applications also, um, speaking of the, the feature phones, SMS for places that don't have a lot of smartphone um, either penetration or connectivity. In this case, you can use smartphones for um, maternal and child health purposes, so to either impart education where mothers might have a question about, you know, I'm feeling this or I am at this stage of my pregnancy, what should I be expecting? You can use um, this technology for education, for monitoring, um, just general being able to improve the, the whole scope of, of health for, in that instance, uh, maternal and child health, but also for chronic disease management and such. 
Technology has really had a great impact also um, on the economy in some of these places in this area of micro lending or um, micro economies, microfinance. Kiva, as I mentioned, was one um, organization that does this. They're based here in the US, but they're really taking the power of the internet to, to scale and having a wonderful inter interaction between small enterprise uh, folks in remote areas in Africa or Southeast Asia, et cetera, where often there are women entrepreneurs too who are trying to sell their beads. These are beads from Uganda that the women have made um, in, by rolling pieces of paper and then putting lacquer on them to make beads and then they, they sell them. What Kiva does is to offer these small investments, small loans that are really going to help women or other small entrepreneurs really get their businesses off the ground. Um, and then the money is repaid. So we, anyone can go online and make a loan. And you can read stories about the different uh, entrepreneurs that you might want to support, different industries or, or sectors that you might want to support, and make a direct loan. And then the money, it, you can either reinvest or it comes back to you. But I thought this is a really tr um, innovative and terrific way of using the, the worldwide internet technology to be able to, to make a difference here. We heard yesterday from uh, Tapan Parikh about uh, awaz.de, which is an SMS application for, um, for farmers. Well, no, actually it was IVR, wasn't it? It was a voice recording, um, which is important as well. But for the, the point is the mobile technology for supporting agriculture. Um, when farmers have questions about crops or about the weather or about crop prices or whatnot, they can use this kind of mobile technology to get information either from a central authority, you know, some kind of agriculture specialist, or from each other, which I think is a wonderful um, innovation as well. And it turns out that the farmers actually want to hear more from each other than from the, the specialist. A lot of us uh, work in this kind of sensor uh, space or device design, and there are, of course, a number of um, innovations in this area, too. You can use these sensors for not only um, monitoring uh, infrastructure and things like transportation and water, as I mentioned before, but also things like water pump maintenance. So a lot of these organizations will go into an area that needs to build a water pump. There are big community celebrations around it being uh, now available, healthy, clean water. But then six months later, the organization has moved on. No one there knows how to fix the part that's broken. And um, you know the NGO can claim success by having built X number of water pumps, but how many are actually still functioning? These sensors can tell either people at, back at a home headquarters or, or closer by what's still working and what needs to be repaired. Um, so that can help the organizations be more efficient and also to provide better um, better service to the communities who are actually using it. There are a number of groups doing this kind of um, rural electrification and, and internet access. We were talking this morning about some projects in Uganda. Um, mesh networks are, are being built in various places in, in South Asia. Um, there are a couple of groups here at UC Berkeley who are working on these projects as well. This is another case that comes um, partly from the UN Global Pulse information about um, mobile applications being used for to detect climate change um, and and food security. So in that case, it, uh, this project is mobile networks as drought sensors in the Sahel. So we can really get a better sense using people who are already on the ground with technology in their hands to have a, a better picture of what the, the overall um, scene is and what interventions might be most effective. I want to give a few examples of how technology is being used for feedback. So we go and we have all of these great projects we're all developing. How do we then monitor them and know that they're being successful? Are they really meeting the goals that we say we're setting out to try to achieve? Um, there are a few organizations that are working on this. Feedback Labs is a really great one that's come up in the last 18, 18 months or two years um, that, whose purpose is to get feedback about some of these humanitarian efforts. So I encourage you to, to look at their work. The Center for Effective Global Action, also at UC Berkeley, um, does this kind of, of um, monitoring and, and evaluation plan. There's one particular tool that we're developing at the Data and Democracy Initiative that I wanted to tell you about um, in this area. There, the California Report Card and Uganda Cafe are based on the same platform. Cafe 
is an acronym for the Collective Assessment and Feedback Engine. Uh, so we're using this first here in California, and if any of you are residents of California, I encourage you to, to check it out and offer your own feedback as well. Um, it's based on an earlier version called Opinion Space. The idea is that we're trying to gather sentiment from a range of stakeholders, citizens um, and experts. Uh, and in this case, this was developed in 2009 under Hillary Clinton at the State Department where we were asking questions about people's views of uh, priorities of US foreign, foreign policy. Um, so we went and asked a number of questions related to um, investments in women's initiatives, uh, investments in um, Pakistan and India, uh, situation in the Middle East, et cetera, to see where people felt um, the US priority should be and what their suggestions might be. This is the other important piece of it. So there's qualitative input as well as quantitative. We then kind of map that onto this idea of citizen report cards, which had been developed in Bangladesh even earlier, um, where you have this familiar kind of template. Everybody knows what a report card is more or less. You know, you get a grade from A to F. You get to grade how your state is doing or how the, the government is doing. So in this case, we developed it in collaboration with the Office of the Lieutenant Governor, Gavin Newsom, for here in California, the California report card. Um, and as you might know, Newsom is a great champion of this space of civic tech. He wrote a book called Citizenville, where he's really uh, espousing the power and value of social media and citizen input into the workings of, of government, and especially local government. Um, having been the mayor of San Francisco, he really feels like the city is one place where you have a lot of leverage, where citizens have a lot of leverage to make change at the local level. Um, so now that he's lieutenant governor, we're working on, with him on the uh, project that is spanning the state of California. If you go to citizen, uh, CaliforniaReportCard.org, you'll see it has two parts. You go through and can rate the state. You give a grade, A to F, on six different uh, topics. And then you have an opportunity to go in and rate the suggestions of others, suggestions of what other people feel the state should be paying attention to. Um, and then you can make your own suggestion, which people then can rate. So we wanted to have, again, this qualitative piece where you can grade the state, how well it's doing on these different issues, but then also to have this, um, uh, have the quantitative piece, but then have the qualitative piece where people can make their own suggestions and have this community kind of crowdsourced idea, crowdsourced decision making. So here are the two stages. This is pretty much what it looks like. Um, you get to make grades. And then the other key thing about this platform that's nice is that at the end, after you've graded, you can see where your grade falls in comparison to the median. So you have this kind of instant feedback that you don't get in regular surveys that you might be answering on the phone or filling out, et cetera. You have um, really rapid, rapid response and, and um, feedback from, of how you're positioned relative to the rest of the people who are taking the surveys. So far, we've had about 11,000 participants um, go through the platform, and I encourage you to do it. We uh, have received responses from every county in California. We would still like to have more um, involvement from especially the Central Valley and the less urban areas. We have a lot from the Bay Area and Los Angeles area, not so much from other parts of the state. So we recently launched version two, which now has this rapid translation possibility into Spanish. And we're monitoring that closely to see um, how we can get more input um, both in Spanish but also um, even on the quantitative part from Spanish speakers. One thing that emerged from this, and I think it's really key to have this involvement of uh, some kind of official who can take action based on the information that they're getting. This is often the case, the question that we get, well, so I'm going to go take the survey, then what happens? Um, this is one area where we can say, look, we're working with people in government. They're listening. They want to know what... Um, what you have to say and what your priorities are. In this case, we had an event with Gavin Newsom back in March, and based on some of the early feedback that we got, we found that people were very interested in disaster preparedness. They were concerned about earthquakes, concerned about wildfires, concerned about you know, eventual sea level rise. Um, so in response to that, Newsom has said, disaster preparedness is now my number one, or is my top priority. I guess he wouldn't say number one. That would be a little tricky. <laughs> um, so he's going to call together a task force or take some action. He heeded the concerns that he heard from the California report card. And we also have created a next 
version of the report card that we're launching actually this week. Uh, it's shakeout day on October 16th, um, where people are supposed to take uh, stock of where they are in their preparations for an eventual earthquake. Um, so we're coming up with a similar kind of platform to help people get an understanding of how prepared they are, how prepared they are in comparison to their neighbors, and to offer suggestions again about how they could become better prepared. So just quickly, I'll go through um, this Uganda Cafe, which is a version that we used in Uganda to, um, to assess the effectiveness of family planning and reproductive health methods at a couple of um, nutrition education centers in the Kamuli district of, of Uganda, which is just a couple hours outside of Kampala. So Uganda, some of the statistics that I was looking at, and, and our colleague Brandy Nanaki was the one who really ran this, um, this project, some of the statistics about um, childbearing and reproductive health are really astonishing in Uganda. Something like 25% of women ages 15 to 19 either have one child or are pregnant. So those are very high rates of child, child pregnancy, even higher than um, in the neighboring countries like Rwanda and, and Kenya. And also contraceptive use is much lower in Uganda than it is in those other countries. So in this nutrition, there were three nutrition uh, education centers where we sat with the women and talked with them about their attitudes toward plan family planning and reproductive health and really trying to get at the basis of their fears and concerns around um, contraception. So we were able to sit with the women. We had surveys of about 140 women. Um, and tried to get a sense of where, you know, where they were and what their, what their concerns were. So here's the version of the platform that we used in, in the district, um, trying to assess that effectiveness and to get a sense of how the nutrition centers could also be include, uh, improved. What we found was that the, of the three nutrition centers, the ones uh, that had been established the longest, the women's fears were less than in the one that was newer. So the uh, women who had been coming back regularly and getting these messages about the effectiveness of you know, the, the pill or the shots or the IUDs or whatever the method might be had less fear about it than the ones that had been exposed less to it in the newer nutrition center. Um, so in response to that, the, this organization is going to be stepping up some of its um, uh, trainings and also to en encourage the women to talk to each other more, maybe have more interaction from the centers that were already established versus the, versus the new one. So next steps, we're talking um, with some uh, university in Mexico, ITESM, Tech de Monterrey is one of the largest private universities, multi-campus universities in Mexico. We have a meeting with them this week. A delegation is coming up to visit with us. Um, probably also on this health topic, but the, the CAFE platform is really very flexible and could be used to assess any number of humanitarian interventions. So here just I'll pose a, a few more challenges and, and some opportunities. Challenges I think in using technology, at least in some of the examples that I've been talking about where you're looking at social media or web-based platforms, is this uh, low literacy rate in some cases. And that's why I think uh, Tapan's example of the interactive voice response is really important and something for us all to think about. It's not that everyone has smartphones and even in the feature phone sometimes the low literacy rate um, can be an obstacle. So thinking about what kind of voice activated responses we can use um, is also important. Conflict is always an issue. I was looking at some statistics, you know, thinking about, well, why did I start out the presentation talking about human rights when we're talking about humanitarian aid? But in, if you look at the statistics about where, say, USAID is making investments, at least half of those investments are going to countries that have been affected by conflict. So conflict has a huge um, sort of backdrop in many cases uh, in, against any of these humanitarian um, kind of interventions, whether it's in energy or, you know, healthcare or food security or whatever it might be. You have to really think about conflict as well. And sometimes conflict is being driven by these very um, things that we're also trying to measure by drought, climate change, population movement, those kind of things. This has been mentioned before, but the importance of local partners is really essential. You have to have partners on the ground, and as difficult as it is, um, you know, sometimes working with big organizations, it's hard. But I think at universities, in some cases, we are in a very special place where 
we are large organizations, but often we have these smaller research centers that can go out into the field and work with small organizations very effectively and really learn a lot from them that could then potentially be scaled larger um, to bigger NGOs. But we should take advantage of, of those opportunities to work closely with partner organizations. And also uneven access to the internet and to ICTs. Here's a, a histogram of the internet population and penetration. And it's a little bit difficult to see the gradient here, but um, you can see how large, say, China is as far as population goes, but then it only has, um, I think that's 40 to 60 percent internet penetration, whereas some of these smaller countries like Canada, if you're looking at the population, it's, it's slim, um, but it has over 80 percent um, internet penetration. So these are all difficult um, challenges, things for us to think about uh, as we're developing our, our, our interventions here. I love this quote, the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed. So as we're thinking about this, um, you know, what can we do? And coming from the Data and Democracy Initiative, I want things to be more equitably um, distributed. So I, I'm trying to, to think about ways to do that. What are some opportunities? I think we look, in some cases, at this idea of leapfrog technology. In Africa, they haven't had the resources to build the land lines that um, have been grown up in some of the more established areas, like the US and Europe. But this can actually be a, a real advantage in some cases. You can go over that sort of landline limitation and go right to mobile technology. Same thing in energy. In some cases, um, the, the places where the infrastructure is not as built out yet, we can go in or the partners in the field can go in and, and use less um, destructive methods using solar, using renewable energy um, that's going to be a lot more sustainable. This is a picture from the uh, One Laptop Per Child project. So I would say another opportunity is this huge youth um, bubble that we see in a lot of countries. If it can be um, harnessed and educated in, in wise and appropriate ways. I don't want to be naive about this because I think that technology is, is neutral. It's not an unmitigated good. Um, it can be used just as easily to spread hate as we heard last night or to you know, recruit terrorists and such. So I don't want to be you know, rosy-eyed about it. I think we need to be aware of that as well. But it does offer huge opportunities um, for, for spreading education and helping to improve the world in a, a number of ways. Another opportunity, I think, is conferences like these and really um, being able to share best practices, share experiences. Um, there are a number of investments being made. I know that new programs are coming up um, in development engineering, trying to harness some of the interest and enthusiasm of students to go out and do good in the world and combine their tech savvy with something that's going to, to make a difference in, in less resource um, privileged areas. That's what I have to leave you with. Thank you. I see the questions are coming. Yeah, Berkeley is a university, yet you didn't mention students. Where do the students fit in? Do they, uh, are there classes in here? Um, uh, is this a major for a student? Um, do they get involved with projects? Do they get credit for being involved with the projects? And to get uh, are there trips that they go on? They get time off, or to do the trips, maybe take a semester going uh, overseas, or whatever. Also, the faculty are they dedicated faculty, or is this a side thing for the faculty? And one of the things we found when we were talking about this five, six, seven years ago, the faculty people said to young new faculty, "Don't get involved in humanitarian because mm. you'll never get tenure." Mm. Has that changed? Yeah, those are good questions. Thank you. Um, I think students absolutely are amazing and inspiring, and a lot of them are very um, entrepreneurial. Uh, at Berkeley, there's another program, I, I went by it in the previous slide, at the Blum Center for Developing Economies. They have this big ideas contest um, that's specifically for students to come up with great ideas in, for social benefit projects in a number of different categories. I didn't focus so much on students in Citrus because we're a research organization. So we actually don't teach or offer degrees, but we work with faculty members um, on their research. So our engagement with students is more as graduate students within a faculty lab, or increasingly we're also working with students who want to do hackathons or student groups who want to work in this area um, and are looking for examples. 
I think you make a good point about um, the faculty requirements for tenure and you know trying to think about how faculty members can be encouraged to, um, to move into this area as well. I think that is changing um, somewhat. And you'll see that uh, it's older, probably older faculty members who feel like they can then at some point kind of shift their research once they're more established into some of these more speculative kind of areas. But I think it is also a big opportunity even for young faculty to say, look, here are um, you know, new ways to test technology, develop new technology. We have to come up with good questions that require technical innovation, not just application of existing technology. So at Citrus, that's a little bit where we, where we come together because we want to be able to encourage this new techn technological development and innovations for sure. But then we also are mindful that it can be applied, that it's not just going to stay in the lab, but that it's actually going to be field tested and, and moved out in a way that's going to be, um, that's going to have an impact. We have two microphones. Catherine over there, this one here. We're asking for uh, a limit of about 30 seconds for your question. We don't want a one to 10 minute discussion, okay? <laughs> Any Raise your question? hand if you want a microphone. Thank you. Someone in the back over there. How does Citrus get its funding? Uh, we get most of our funding from the UC Office of the President. So we're a public institution. We're funded by, by tax dollars, just like the rest of the UC, to an ever-decreasing amount, right? Um, but Citrus gets most of its funding from the Office of the President. So we're also looking at partnerships. We have a few partnerships with um, outside organizations, industry, um, other academic institutions in some cases. Uh, but we're primarily publicly funded. Hi. Um, it's great to see that Gavin Newsom is like getting involved in this space. And as, as uh, open government, open data kind of percolate in the tech community uh, and into the kind of the media, do you see uh, politicians beginning to identify this space as a, as a place where they can get like a competitive advantage over their opponents and kind of incorporate it into their platform? And if so, what does that look like to you and like what does that mean for the future? Yeah, I think it's a really exciting time and I think how much the politicians get into it or get behind it really depends on their, in some cases their generation, but then also just their interest and background and how, how much they know about it. I think it could be an opportunity probably to connect um, with certain sectors of their potential voters, you know, maybe younger people or people who are more technologically savvy. But I think even this um, movement toward data journalism, say, um, and getting better, more and better data, more interactive kind of data, that ever, the, the, the tide is rising, raising all boats in some ways, um, that we're all becoming a little bit more educated about how data can be used. Um, I think open data can be tremendously uh, powerful, but it hasn't gone far enough yet. And the important thing is not just that the data is then out there, but then there are visualizations and applications that can be used to make sense of it, that advocacy organizations know then what to do with it, to, to use it. How is this data going to be actionable? Um, I think it's, it's inevitable, but uh, it'll, we'll just see how, how fast the trajectory is um, to get more, more data out there and to create these open data standards that are going to make it better and easier to make comparisons across states, across countries, et cetera. Hi, how open? Uh, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. You, all right, sorry, I'll go, I'll go, I'll go. Mine's pretty quick. So I kind of want to just address something that the fellow in the front kind of addressed initially in terms of accessing students. Mm -hmm. And as an undergraduate, that's something I, I feel is very valuable because my experience in research has kind of sprung a career in, uh, you know, sustainable, um, sustainable uh, ventures and practices of that sort. So I was curious um, why, like, to a degree, tapping the undergraduate network at Berkeley could not only produce like sus sustainable ventures for the future, but also um, kind of building up this network of individuals who are going to make an impact um, beyond just the current faculty that do it today. So I was curious, um, is there anything in place that you would uh, consider tapping this undergraduate network to kind of build it up um, and have that sustainable impact for the future? 
Yeah, you're totally right, and I, I agree with you. One program that we established just this last year is called the Mobile App Challenge. Um, this is run through the Social Apps Lab. So that was largely an undergraduate enterprise where you had to have teams of at least three students come together to create over the course of a semester, um, not just the sort of uh, kickoff ideation design prototyping that you might get out of a hackathon, but really to have an extended period where they get coaching and mentoring on creating business plans, making pitches, um, really thinking through their product and testing it. Um, and where Citrus has a niche, I think, this kind of hackathon idea is happening all over in all kinds of different sectors, but Citrus were really focused on the interest of society piece. So at UC Berkeley this past weekend, there was this huge hackathon called Cal Hacks. There were some 1,200 students there, I think. It was this student-run thing. Took over Memorial Stadium. It was amazing. Um, but still, a lot of these uh, applications are meant as you know, commercial ventures or software or whatnot that might, um, might or might not be uh, in the interest of society. So that's, I think, where Citrus can have a role, is really trying to encourage students, whether that's by offering pizza or you know, bringing together um, folks and offering space. We have a beautiful building on the Berkeley campus, and so we often do a lot of hosting of hackathons, and not just in the software space, I should say, but also hardware and device design, because we have an invention lab there and some other spaces where you can actually make things. Um, we work for the government in the Philippines, and I was wondering how open Citrus would be to partner with countries outside the U.S. and be able to come up with apps that would help the society in other countries, developing countries. Yeah, absolutely. We um, would love to talk about how we could um, have partnerships with countries outside the U.S. We had the project in Uganda. We have MOUs with a number of European countries, but in, um, in organizations in European countries. Uh, also with the University of Rwanda. Um, and it's interesting, you mentioned the Philippines. There has been this Philippine-California research initiative created in order to um, enhance these partnerships between specifically the Philippines and UC, UC Berkeley researchers. So we can talk about that more. But yeah, we would be completely open to that. I like the question that you raised just now about undergraduate students. Because I am greatly convinced that unless we harness the power of undergraduates at early stage, we won't be able to build a different culture in times to come. So I, we have been trying an initiative which our president has been popularizing in NIT's National Institute of Technologies and Central Universities, which is to create innovation clubs to search, spread, celebrate innovations, and sense the unmet needs. Mm -hmm. The last part is important. If every undergraduate student could map one unmet social need, mm -hmm. We could, have, we could use this platform or this kind of technologies to have a huge agenda for IEEE and any, any other professional association to engage experts in solving those problems. So I think this could be wonderful to match, map the big data technology with the undergraduate students and their desire to map unmet social needs. Yeah, Thank absolutely, you. I agree. Great, okay, we have time for maybe one more question and then we'll call it a session. Anybody? One more. Okay, there you go. Uh, wonderful talk. Thank you very much. Uh, I just have a simple question. Uh, you mentioned about open data. Uh, how do you know it's open? What do you? I don't I mean, quite understand. I mean, your what is the source of the data, and how do you know that they're really coming from, uh, you know, independent people? How can you trust? How can because you trust it? Any government workshop, uh, I mean, website, I don't think they're open because you know the government might just get data of their own choice, and you don't really know how the data has been collected. Uh huh. So I was wondering, is there any way that you can uh, ensure the data is really independently collected and doesn't have any vested interest in it? And you know, that was my curiosity. Yeah, that's interesting. No, I think you're probably right to be skeptical. Um, there are organizations that are hiring um, people like chief data officers now because there is so much data available, and it's it can be a burden on staff to try to make it to make it available. A lot of information that had been say locked up in PDF format or other kind of non um, machine readable formats, it takes work to to make it available. Um, 
I guess I would just keep asking questions and have folks who are in the organizations, in the government itself, um, you know, respond to, to questions like that. Uh, at least in the, in the US, there are laws about making data available that in the past you had to respond to, say, Freedom of Information Act requests for data. Um, and so there, if they withheld or tried to, um, you know, misconstrue the data, it would be illegal. But, you know, I think there are other cases where that might not be true. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Here is an indestructible emergency light flare. I look forward to playing with it. <laughs> and a uh, couple of notes. Uh, so we have, as I mentioned, a very complete track. We're going to have our, our normal tracks running. I do have one request. For those of you who are a track chair, please show up 15 minutes early before your session. And those of you speaking, also, please show up 15 minutes early so we can get these presentations loaded ahead of time and start on time. <laughs> Uh, the other thing we have is at uh, coming up at 10.30, we also have the site folks. If those of you who were very curious what was going on in that room over there yesterday, they're now having an open workshop if you have more interest in site. So that's coming up. And then also in the afternoon, we have our demonstrations, presentations, and we also have some more uh, excellent speakers in part of the X-Track. So have a good day.